Hello, I'm Dr. Kathy Muller, and on behalf of Integrative Medicine at Trinity Health of New England, I'm pleased to welcome you to this week's installment of Wellness Wednesday. Wellness Wednesday is designed, designed to bring you in brief uh, approaches to health and wellness that you can implement now. And this week's conversation is focusing on um, insomnia. We began talking about lack of sleep last week and the importance of having um, adequate sleep, and so we're continuing that conversation this week. So let's just begin by talking about what happens when we don't have sleep. And so we have this challenge when we aren't sleeping, that our minds are racing, we're wide awake when we should be asleep, and it's called hyperarousal. And when we have hyperarousal, we have elevated heart rates, we have increased body and brain activity that our bodies think that we're awake, we have elevated body temperature. Typically, your body temperature is supposed to go down at night when you sleep. Brain waves, if we measure them with an EEG, would look like we were awake. And we have increased nighttime stress hormones, which are supposed to go down. So this is a challenge. We also have a decrease in melatonin. Melatonin doesn't make us sleepy, but it facilitates sleep by um, uh, causing chemical changes in the brain that allow us to sleep more easily. So that goes down as well when we're in this hyperaroused state, when we have lots of stress or other things going on. I think so often, too, we are plagued by our old-fashioned thoughts about what sleep actually is. And so I want to go through some of those um, misinformation, some of that misinformation so we can restructure it and understand that we're not so far off. <laughs> so I should sleep at least eight hours every night. Well, eight hours is great, but not for everybody. Some people need less. Some people need more. We know that we should dedicate a minimum of five hours of, to sleep each night because less than that, we have altered brain function. I should fall asleep quickly. Well, yes or no. If you fall asleep too quickly, maybe you're overtired. If you don't fall asleep quickly enough, perhaps you're overtired as well. So I think that's a, a false um, idea that we need to get rid of. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of time. I should always sleep through the night. No, none of us have perfect sleep every night. Absolutely none of us. And I should and must get myself to sleep. Well, as we discussed last week, if, you ever, if you've ever had a two-year-old, you can't make a two-year-old sleep. You can make a quiet room, a warm environment, make sure they're dry, make sure they're fed. You can't make yourself sleep. We can just facilitate sleep. I should just rest in bed if I can't sleep. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. When we use a cognitive behavioral approach to sleep, Sometimes we encourage people to get out of bed because there's a negative association with being in bed. I'm going to show you a tool, though, I think you can use without needing to get out of bed that I think we should try first. And I'll have a terrible day if I don't sleep well. Maybe, but we are remarkably resilient creatures. And so most of us can function. It's just when it becomes a long-term thing that it becomes a really big issue. So as I said last week, we talked about bed noise, about creating an environment that facilitates sleep. And this week, we're going to add on to the noise reduction approach of insomnia, mind noise. So mind noise, we also talked about last week, the idea of stress and working and pandemics and trying to take care of home and family and ourselves all can make us incredibly stressed. And so how do we reduce this mind noise? so that we can be our better selves and sleep better. Well, we also talked about turning the whole idea of making ourselves sleep on its head last week. We need to practice letting go of waking rather than causing ourselves to be sleepy. Although you can do that with medication, there are ways that we can let go of our awakeness that can facilitate sleep for all of us. We talked again last week about clock watching. This is a really big one. When you wake up at three in the morning and you have to get up at six, and you start panicking, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to miss that big meeting, or I have to drive, or I have to do whatever, it gets us more anxious. So set your alarm, put the clock away, and don't look at it till the next morning. The other thing that we need to do is we need to sort of change our behavior around bedtime. We shouldn't be watching horror movies or reading, you know, crime fiction novels before we go to bed if we're having trouble sleeping. 
We should be doing something restful and relaxing, but also one that takes very little um, advanced brain activity. So reading, watching screens, uh, doing your taxes, balancing the checkbook, all takes cognitive effort. We want something like folding laundry, washing dishes, cleaning the bathroom, whatever you need to do, but something that doesn't take a whole lot of cognitive effort to begin that transition into um, sleepfulness. Um, the bedroom should be used for sleep and sex only. When we bring other things into the bedroom, that can also begin to cloud and disturb our minds that we're trying to get to settle down and let go of waking. Peace with your sleep partner. This is really important. Uh, always a work in progress, but know that this can be certainly a significant cause of insomnia. We should also think about our dreams. I think they tell us a lot about what's happening in our day, what's happening in our lives. And so my practice is I have a pad of paper next to my bed and a pen right on it that is open. And so I, when I have a dream, I will reach over, not turn the light on, scribble down whatever I remember. Sometimes I can read it the next morning, sometimes I can't. But it helps sort of dump it out of my head and get it onto paper. As we discussed briefly, we should limit our exposure to stressful imagery, books, TV, radio, all that sort of stuff. The news may be keeping you awake, and so perhaps we need to let that go as our pre-bedtime -bed routine, at least for a few weeks until a good sleep pattern is reestablished. And then there's so many relaxation practices and rituals that you can add into your pre-bedtime routine. Sometimes you can do them right in bed. Sometimes you do them before you go to bed. It's really up to you, but I have a few that I'd like to share with you. So first is guided imagery. This is so beneficial. One can turn on on their iPhone, on the radio, on a CD player, um, a guided imagery that can lead you into better sleep. You can set a timer, at least on an iPhone you can, so that it turns off without you having to do it. But listening to someone else guide you into sleep can be remarkably beneficial. If you have a sleep partner that doesn't want to listen to it, you can stick one earbud in, or there are headphones that are specifically designed to wear to bed. Although I don't love the electromagnetic waves from an, a phone next to your head, in particular when you go to sleep, I think during a period of insomnia, it's a really good tool that may help you get to sleep more quickly. Um, initially, this is a little bit easier than meditation because it's someone else doing the work for you and you just get to follow their voice and do what they ask you to do. So it's a little simpler, a little bit cleaner, particularly if you're sleep deprived and you're frustrated. Belarus Naprasak is my absolute favorite and you can Google her name, Belarus, and Kaiser. And Kaiser has free podcasts that you could download. It is one in particular for sleep. There's also a tool, and this may be a little bit hard to see on the screen, but I'm going to go through it. This is my favorite mindful sleep induction technique. It's incredibly very, it's incredibly simple, and you don't need to reach for any tools. You don't need headphones. You begin with one hand on your chest and one hand on your abdomen. And you take a deep breath, and you make sure that you're doing abdominal breathing, which means when the breath goes in, your abdominal, your abdomen should pooch out, and when you breathe out, it should go back in. And so you just practice that. And once you get this down, you don't need to use your hands if you don't want to. I find it um, restful to be able to use my hands anyway. Then you take a slow, deep breath in through your nose, and you do it over the count of three to four. So in, two, three, four. And then you don't hold, but you pause, and then you exhale for double that number. So if you inhale to three, you exhale to six. If you inhale to four, you exhale to eight. And so it should be twice as long as your inhalation. And then you let your thoughts focus on counting. And the counting is often just enough of a distraction that your mind gets pulled away from the stressful event or thing that you were thinking about when you woke up. Now, you repeat the cycle. You do it eight times. And when you finish those eight breaths, you gently readjust yourself. It's not like you need to flip from your back to your belly. You just gently readjust yourself in bed, get yourself comfortable again, and do it again. Eight breaths into your nose, out through your mouth. The out breath is twice as long as the in breath. And most people don't get through four cycles without, um, without seeing a benefit. So that is the approach to mind noise that we're talking about with insomnia. 
I'm going to encourage you to try these tools, and the resources will be available at the end of the video. Next week, we'll be talking about body noise, the third part in our three-part series on insomnia. Have a good week.